All right, hello everybody and welcome to the, uh, to the last lecture, to the closing lecture. Can you close the door behind you, please? Um, to the closing lecture of this course. And uh, in the whole course, we mostly spoke about situations where the cells are functioning normally, they have plenty of oxygen, they have plenty of nutrients, they have all the metabolic pathways run the, the right way or the way uh, which is described in textbooks. But today I want to look at situations where these things don't work normally or situations in which often cells find even in health and especially in disease where some of the either nutrients or oxygen or something else is missing or goes wrong. Um, and we will look at mechanisms that our cells use to adapt to these situations. And again, some of these situations will be unusual, pathological, but for many cells, these situations that we'll look at are everyday situations, okay? They live in environments where something is not readily available and they have to adapt to that. So the, the title of the lecture is Extreme Situations in Cells, uh, and some of them are going to be quite extreme, uh, but at the same time, be aware that for some types of cells, these situations may be how they live their whole lives. Let's put it that way. So the, the main situations that I want to cover today uh, are hypoxia, so lack of oxygen, then lack of nutrients. Usually these two situations, well not usually, but sometimes these two types of situations combine together in the form of a pathological state, which you may have heard about, but you will definitely hear about, which is called ischemia. And ischemia is is a condition where part of an organ, part of a tissue, or a clump of cells, or whatever, lose their blood supply, usually by means of a blood clot. So a typical example of acute ischemia would be myocardial infarction, heart attack, okay? Or uh, a cerebrovascular event, okay? Um, so those kind of things cause ischemia, which is basically stopping the supply of both oxygen and nutrients together. But we will look at hypoxia, lack of oxygen, uh, anoxia and hypoxia, and lack of nutrients separately because the, the combined situations make things a bit more complicated and I will leave that for your pathology course later on, well, in third year or, and fourth year. So hypoxia, lack of nutrients are gonna be the two of them and uh, the, the, the two, um, let's say situations where the cells lack something. Uh, and the third type of situation that we will look at is hyperproliferation. So situations where cells start to grow and proliferate, divide rapidly. And this can happen physiologically, this can happen normal, uh, in normal situations. Which cells, which cell type is known to uh, divide and proliferate quite rapidly in the, in the body? Endothelial cells? You mean in blood vessels? Mm -hmm. Hmm, not really, no. Well, okay, stem cells, but stem cells themselves are actually relatively quiescent and they are only woken up when, when they need to be. Uh, but No, in normal tissues, normal tissues which rapidly divide. I mean, okay, skin epithelium to some extent. Yeah, okay, but a typical example of an epithelium which is rapidly, divides rapidly and is rapidly exchanged. Intestinal lining, okay, intestinal epithelium, okay? The, 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 um, the, the normal duration of existence for, a, for an enterocyte is about two or three days, okay? So they are actually quite rapidly exchanged all the time. So that would be one of those cells that, that divide rapidly. But of course, it could be, uh, for example, white blood cells during an infection where they need to expand quite rapidly, they need to divide quite rapidly, and these would be also considered in this 
clump of hyperproliferative states. But of course, the best known pathological condition where there's rapid proliferation of cells is of course cancer. So we will look at how both cancer cells and rapidly dividing normal cells adapt their metabolism uh, to the needs of hyperproliferation because it's a very specific type of existence because most of the cells in our body don't really divide. They are terminally differentiated, they just sit there, they do their function, but they're not really growing or rapidly dividing. So it's a special type of situation. So these three situations we'll cover, but we will look at these situations towards the second half of the lecture, towards the end of the lecture. But before we actually look at what happens in these situations, let's talk about three most important, I guess, most important uh, regulators, sensors, or switches in the cells that tell the cell how it's doing, how it's doing regarding metabolism, availability of ATP, availability of oxygen. So we will look at three big important regulatory complexes or regulatory, yeah, mostly they're complexes, um, which are crucial for the adaptation that we are talking about. So for adaptation uh, to situations which are a little bit unusual. Okay, and these switches, these sensors are actually present in most cells or in all cells, and they help these cells, uh, as I said, adapt to even short-term changes in availability of oxygen, nutrients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, the the first sensor that I want to talk about uh, is called AMP-dependent kinase or AMP kinase. Now, what is a kinase? What kind of an enzyme? What, what kind of reaction does it does a kinase? It is a type of transferase. What does it transfer? From from ATP. That's important. Okay, so that's important. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a kinase. Okay, so it takes a phosphate group from ATP. It transfers it, transfers it to something else. Now, here specifically, we're talking about protein kinase. And you will see a lot of protein kinases, especially in the next course, when we talk about signaling and signaling cascades. Lot of, a lot of these signaling cascades contain or use protein kinases. And these protein kinases, they are kinases, so they take uh, a phosphate group from ATP and they put it onto a protein. There are several amino acids that can be phosphorylated. Can you guess which ones those could be? I mean, in a protein, so, pro so amino acid residues, which could be phosphorylated to which a phosphate group can be added? Yeah, with OH group. So which ones are those? There's tyrosine, serine. Hmm? Cysteine has an OH group? Threonine, okay. Any other ones? Methionine's got OH group? <laughs> Definitely not. Um, all right, so these three, so serine, threonine, and tyrosine. So we can actually divide protein kinases, and this is just a preview of the next course. You don't have to focus on it now, but we can divide protein kinases into serine threonine kinases. So those are the kinases that put the phosphate group on serine or threonine, and then tyrosine kinases, and these are separate groups. So AMP kinase is actually a serine threonine kinase which means that it takes a phosphate group from ATP and puts it onto another protein's serine or threonine in the structure. Now, what is the point of this? The point is to change the activity of the target protein by means of this phosphorylation. So this phosphorylation is what we call post-translational post modification. So it's a modification of an already made protein and it can switch the activity of an enzyme or a transcription factor or something something else, okay? So this is a very common strategy, and again, in the next course you will see a lot of cases when this happens, when there's a protein kinase, and changes the activity of a protein, of an enzyme, or something else, uh, through phosphorylation. So AMP kinase is a serine threonine protein kinase, and as the name suggests, it is activated by AMP, by adenosine monophosphate. Now where does adenosine monophosphate come from? in our metabolism, AMP. 
I'm not talking about the, I'm not asking about the synthesis of the whole thing, okay, that we will cover later on, but. So it is synthesized, yeah, as uh, a nucleotide, etc. But yeah, that, that is, and we will cover the synthesis later on. But my question is, uh, because AMP kinase actually serves as a sensor of ATP, how much ATP we have in the cell, okay? So it's a, it is really a sensor, or rather, more specifically, it acts as a sensor of ATP to ADP ratio. Why, why is the ratio important? Why are we talking about ATP to ADP ratio? Because that's what drives reactions, how far they are from equilibrium. Correct. The, the ratio of ATP to ADP tells us how far away from equilibrium we are in the system, and therefore, how much work we can do, okay? If this, if this ratio decreases, there is less work that the cell can do. Okay, so this is what AMP kinase detects. It measures this ATP to ADP ratio. But it measures it through AMP. So the question now is, why AMP? Is there any reaction in the metabolism with ATP that produces AMP? Correct, that, that is true. So there are a few uh, activation reactions which, <clears throat> which release AMP in the end, that is correct. Um, and yes, it would be a source of AMP. But there is a probably more important source of AMP in our metabolism, which is very closely related to a change in this ratio. So what happens if we are using up ATP? We're using up ATP and what is being produced for most things, with the exception of activation of fatty acids and some other activation reactions. What is the, what is the product of that? ADP and inorganic phosphate. Okay, there's ADP and inorganic phosphate. That's the, the usual hydrolysis of ATP, which powers all sorts of things, okay? So we end up with ADP. And is that it? Does and then it can hydrolyze again, the ADP, using one, one more phosphate. Can it? ADP. Can it? No, well, it's easier. Correct. This is where I'm heading. Adenylate? Well, kinase. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. So there is a reaction where the cell can take two molecules of ADP. So when most of the ATP has been used and there's accumulation of ADP, there's a reaction where the cell can take two ADPs make one ATP, so basically what, take one of the phosphates and put it on the other molecule, make one ATP plus one AMP. And the enzyme that catalyzes this is called adenylate kinase, and it's an extremely important enzyme in our metabolism because it allows us to use a little bit more of the energy that is stored in ATP than, we, than the cell would normally, uh, or without this reaction that the cell would be able to. Okay, so this adenylate kinase reaction is absolutely crucial for our metabolism. Now, this reaction means that as the amount of ATP or the ratio of ATP to ADP declines in the cell, at the same time, the concentration of AMP is going to go up. And this is the connection between this ratio and AMP and AMP dependent kinase, okay? So as the amount of ATP declines, the, the amount of AMP goes up, which activates AMP kinase, and AMP kinase will start phosphorylating all sorts of proteins to change the metabolism, to switch metabolism in the cell so that the cell once again has enough ATP. That's the whole idea of AMP kinase as this metabolic switch or sensor and switch. Okay. Now, what would be the pathways that the activation of AMP kinase would switch on or activate, and which pathways would AMP kinase switch off in this situation? So, what would be the pathways to switch on? Well, not necessarily pathways, but which enzymes or proteins or processes would you, if you were designing a cell, uh, which you have MP kinase uh, switch Krebs on. Cycle. Hmm? Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. Okay. So Krebs cycle, yeah, absolutely. That is one of the pathways to produce quite a lot of ATP, not directly, 
but obviously through, what, what else do we need? Correct, so we also need a functioning electron transport chain, okay? But Krebs cycle would definitely be one of the pathways to be switched on. And how does it work? <clears throat> it actually works through the activation of the enzyme that acts as a gatekeeper for the Krebs cycle. Which enzyme is that? Not really. So, the, so we're talking about activation of the Krebs cycle, rather, or, or better put, okay, maybe citrus in this could be a gatekeeper for some situations, but here we are mostly talking about a cell which lacks ATP, so it wants to use glucose to make as much, okay, let's focus on glucose to make it a little bit easier. So it try, tries to make as much ATP from glucose as it can. So which, what, which enzyme would be the most, huh? It would be pyruvate dehydrogenase, because pyruvate dehydrogenase is the enzyme that determines whether pyruvate from glycolysis will be used for something else, making a lactate or something, or it will enter the Krebs cycle, okay? So when we focus on glucose, I think it's a little bit easier to see that pyruvate dehydrogenase would be the one, okay? For beta oxidation, it's a little bit different. Um, all right, so pyruvate dehydrogenase is indeed activated by AMP kinase and allows pyruvate from glycolysis or from other sources, but mostly from glycolysis to flow into the Krebs cycle and make as much ATP as we can. All right, what else would we activate in order to get ATP in a cell which lacks ATP? Which other pathways? Huh? Indeed, glycolysis, absolutely. So glycolysis is activated and the, the target enzyme for the, for the regulation of glycolysis for AMP kinase is actually phosphofructokinase 2. Does anyone recall what phosphofructokinase 2 does? Right, it's, it's an enzyme which produces an activator of glycolysis which is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Does it ring a bell? Yeah? So AMP kinase activates phosphofructokinase, a very interesting enzyme, a bifunctional enzyme, because it's both a kinase and phosphatase, and it's crucial for regulating both glycolysis, increasing the rate of glycolysis, but at the same time, it decreases the rate of gluconeogenesis. Does it ring a bell? All right, so this is the target for AMP kinase and it switches on phosphofructokinase 2 so that glycolysis starts running faster. Okay? Good. Now, you have a question. Yeah, uh, if we said that AMP2 is the regulatory Yes. Why we, uh, we talk about PFK1 as the main uh, limited, limited Yeah, but it's regulated by PFK2. So that's, that's the regulatory enzyme for the main, uh, for the most important step, let's say, for the regulatory step in the, does it make sense? Yeah. yeah, okay. All right, so if we have activated Krebs cycle, we've activated glycolysis, we also need to get the glucose from somewhere, right? Where do we, where do most cells get the glucose from? You want to say something? but it's a regulatory enzyme in glycolysis. Have a look at, have a look at glycolysis, okay? Because there are, there are two different enzymes. One of them is the one that actually runs glycolysis, the other one regulates it. Yeah? Um, so we need to get the glucose from somewhere. Where do we get the glucose from? Most cell, for most cells. Hmm. <laughs> Smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And where, what does glucose do there? Yeah, okay. My question is a little bit different. So the cell is lacking glucose. It does not have glucose, right? It, well, it's lacking ATP. And it wants to make ATP from metabolism of glucose. So it needs to get glucose from somewhere. If it already has glucose 6-phosphate, 
it has no problem, right? It, it just runs it into, into glycolysis. So it's a slightly different situation. We just need to get glucose from somewhere. Where do we get it from? It could be glycogen, but a lot of cells don't have huge stores of glycogen. So for some types of cells, liver, muscle, that could be a possibility. Most cells, hmm, they, do, they may have a little bit of glycogen, so it's a possibility, yeah, glycogenolysis. But most cells will get it from, outside. from the outside, from the blood, right? How do we get glucose from the blood? The blood transporters. Indeed. And this is what AMP kinase can do. So it can increase the amount of glute transporters in the membrane, specifically glute, GLUT1 and GLUT4. Now with GLUT4, everybody tells you that what is, what is special about GLUT4? Insulin independent. Insulin? Dependent. Okay, so they call them insulin dependent, okay? They're definitely not insulin dependent because AMP kinase can also put them on, into the membrane, okay? So what GLUT4 should be called more precisely is that they are insulin sensitive. So insulin can increase the amount of GLUT4 in the membrane, but so can other stimuli, okay? So it's not true that we need insulin in order to have GLUT4 in skeletal muscle, adipose tissue, and elsewhere, because there are other possibilities. So if a cell is lacking ATP and AMPK is activated, then GLUT4 can be put into the membrane and can be used to import glucose even in the complete absence of glucose. A typical example that I use mostly in second year when we talk about metabolism of, of muscle, uh, uh, basically a model situation where you can see this, Okay, imagine that in the morning you haven't had any breakfast, so you haven't eaten for 10 hours or something like that. And you are coming to a lecture which starts at 8, and there's a bus and you have to run to catch the bus, to catch the bus, right? Your muscles may need to get glucose from the outside, but your level of insulin is zero. It's going to be tiny because you haven't eaten, right? But still the muscles are perfectly capable of getting the glucose from the blood through GLUT4, but they do it by activating AMP kinase because they lack ATP. They find out that they don't have enough ATP to keep, to keep you running, basically, okay? So they can use this different um, signaling pathway to get those GLUT4 there, okay? So please don't call GLUT4 as insulin dependent. They're not insulin dependent, but they're insulin sensitive, okay? Yep. Um, if we're talking about extreme situations and we're talking about an activation mechanism, the AMPK, um, let's say that I'm starving, and does that mean that the whole body would use the AMPK, or let's say first the brain because it's more important, and other cells wouldn't uh, utilize this mechanism? Right. Any cell which finds itself in a situation where there's not enough ATP, or rather that the ratio of ATP to ADP declines, will activate AMP kinase, but its reaction will depend on which cell it specifically is. Okay? So if we're talking about about skeletal muscle or the liver, it would start activating, activating glycogenoly glycogenolysis because it can get it from, from glycogen. Other cell types will activate neighboring cells to give them nutrients, etc. So the specific reaction of what happens will differ, but any cell will activate AMP kinase. Okay? Now I just want to say, which I didn't say in the beginning, but um, the lecture that we're having now, the content of the lecture, is completely new. Okay? So, in previous years, this lecture had a completely different content. And in the previous lectures, the, the content of this lecture was really related to inter-organ and inter-tissue relationships and exchanges of nutrients, etc. But that actually fits much better into the second year, not in the first year. So today, we'll be, we'll be talking about cells as if they were basically alone, okay? So we will neglect this idea that, okay, if a cell needs something, it will send a signal to the liver, which will produce something else, etc. Okay? So the focus now is, imagine that we have a, a lone cell, okay, and it needs to fend for itself. It needs to figure out what to do. Okay? So it's a slightly different focus. Okay? Um, so your, your question is absolutely correct and important. Okay? The whole organism, the whole body, will react to starvation in very complex ways where AMP kinase will be activated, but it will produce a lot of different things in different organs, okay?
But here we are looking at one individual kind of generic cell, what it will do if it's lacking ATP. Because the lack of ATP may not be and often isn't because of starvation. Okay? Lack of ATP could be because we ate something, some poison, okay? or because we, the cell doesn't have enough oxygen. All these situations will cause activation of AMP kinase and the cells need to figure out how to survive it. Okay? Good. So, we've activated influx of glucose, if there is any glucose in the blood, of course, there may not be any, but the, the cells will at least try it, okay? Maybe they, they, will not, uh, they will not succeed. Now, so we've activated glycolysis, in, in influx of glucose, we've activated or tried to activate the Krebs cycle, and the Krebs cycle and the respiratory chain, which are crucial for oxidative phosphorylation, are where? Indeed, they're in, mito in mitochondria. So one of the other things that AMP kinase stimulates is mitogenesis, production of new mitochondria. Now that's a relatively complex process because as we all know, mitochondria are semi-autonomous, so they, they have their own mechanisms of replication. But mitogenesis can be activated by these signaling cascades and it is mainly you don't really need to know that. I will just mention it for people who might be interested. It's actually activated by a transcription factor called PGC1-alpha. So it's at the level of a nuclear transcription, which then transcribes genes which activate mitochondria to divide and to, to produce more mitochondrial mass. Okay? So the logic behind these, cell, behind these pathways to be activated is quite clear. Cell is, doesn't have enough ATP, so it just tries to upregulate everything that it can to produce more ATP. Make sense? Good. What will be the pathways to be downregulated? What do we want to stop if we don't have ATP? Uh, gluconeogenesis. Indeed, gluconeogenesis will be downregulated. Makes perfect sense. And we also know the enzyme through which it happens. Okay? So these two things happen at the same time, activation of glycolysis and deactivation of gluconeogenesis. Correct. What other, other pathways are major consumers of ATP that we want to stop? Uh, the urea cycle uses the ATP. Okay, the urea cycle, absolutely, it will be stopped. However, that's a very special pathway that only occurs in very few tissues. Which tissues have urea cycle? Yeah, basically just liver, okay? So yeah, specifically in liver, that would happen, okay? Generally, most cells don't have urea cycle, but yeah, it makes sense, yeah, it would be stopped. Indeed, fatty acid synthesis would be stopped. What is the regulatory enzyme there? Or what is the, the regulatory step? Huh? Acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And that is indeed the enzyme whose activity will be downregulated uh, by phosphorylation through AMP kinase. Okay? So acetyl-CoA carboxylase is the place where AMP kinase will stop this, uh, this pathway. Closely related to, well, closely related, somewhat related to um, fatty acid synthesis, which is another pathway. Hmm? Ketone body synthesis, uh, again, is a specific liver uh, pathway. It only happens in the liver, okay? And I would leave that out because that actually is a catabolic, yeah, let, let's leave that out, okay? But what I'm talking about is a pathway that we haven't covered yet, but we will, I think, in the next course, but it's somewhat related to fatty acid synthesis, and that's cholesterol synthesis or steroid synthesis or isoprenoid synthesis is the correct name. So I'm going to put cholesterol but it's not just cholesterol synthesis. Uh, and there, the regulatory step, does anyone know? I know we haven't covered it, but the Czech students knew it, so for some reason. Uh, the, the regulatory step, I will give you the name of it. Don't worry about it too much now, because we'll cover the whole pathway in the next course, okay? But the, the regulatory step is called HMG-CoA reductase, HMG-CoA reductase, which stands for hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A reductase. That's the main regulatory step in the pathway, and that is going to be blocked by AMP kinase to stop this whole pathway. 
The last thing that I want to mention, which is also activated by AMB kinase, and at the same time is a bridge to the next sensor and switch, is a protein complex. It's another protein kinase, but way bigger and way more complicated uh, than AMP kinase. And this one is called mTOR. mTOR, I'll explain in a second what, what it means. But AMP kinase will decrease the activity of mTOR. <clears throat> and one of the things, we'll see in a second what all the things that mTOR does, but one of the things that a decreased activity of mTOR causes is a proce process called autophagy. What could that mean, autophagy? It digests itself. Indeed, it's a process where the cell can start eating its own components, degrading them into nutrients and using those nutrients to survive, basically. Okay? That is a process for which uh, I think in 2016 there was a Nobel Prize uh, given for the discovery of this process. And for a long time it was thought to be quite rare very like in pathological situations, etc. But nowadays we know that most cells at some point will use autop autophagy, and that is a it's a perfectly normal physiological uh, process, which is not only used in a situation where there's not enough ATP and we need some nutrients which can't, which we can't get from the outside, so we'll we'll start digesting bits of the cell. <clears throat> but autophagy is also used for degrading dysfunctional parts of the um, of the cell. So, for example, when a mitochondrion is not working properly, the cell will use autophagy to destroy it. Same, same thing for bits of endoplasmic reticulum or other organelles. So, autophagy will be activated through this indirect way. So, AMP kinase is, is activated, not enough ATP. It will decrease the activation of mTOR and will increase autophagy. Uh, and as we said, uh, it's, uh, it, it will hopefully produce some nutrients. So now, MTOR, before... MTOR prevents autophagy? Correct. Or? Correct. Normally, mTOR will stop autophagy, okay? But if it's deactivated, autophagy will, will, um, will be activated. Now, autophagy is a process, we could spend a whole lecture just talking about autophagy. It's a, it's a very complex process where basically the cell builds a little vesicle from membranes and from proteins around the bit that it wants to digest. And then this vesicle fuses with lysosomes and the, content, the contents are digested and imported into the cell. Very complicated, highly regulated process which uses lots of different proteins, and it's a really interesting story. I'm not gonna cover it anymore, but if you're interested, read about autophagy. It's, it's a really interesting and really important process in uh, both in health and in disease. There were questions? No? All right. Uh, autophagy can be also uh, a because you've already heard about how proteins are degraded in the, in the cell. What is the, what is the usual pathway for protein degradation? Uh, marks it with the ubiquitin, uh, not ubiquitin, the, 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 the marker, what is it called? What is it called, the marker? Ubiquitin. Ubiquitin, ubiquitin yeah. Ubiquitin. ubiquitin. And then it goes to the lysosome, pr proteasome. Proteasome, yeah. okay, and that's a different thing because that's not a vesicle. The proteasome is, is an enzyme, it's a massive enzyme, okay, which degrades the protein. So that's, that's one pathway of degrading proteins. But actually many misfolded or aggregated proteins would be actually, in normal cells, would be degraded through autophagy. Even things like glycogen, for which we have a perfectly good pathway for, you know, through glycogenolysis, even glycogen can be degraded by autophagy. Okay, so, the, so autophagy is this alternative way of breaking down all sorts of things. Lipid granules or lipid droplets could also be degraded by, uh, by autophagy. So it's a very general process which can do all sorts of things. Very interesting and can be activated through this. <clears throat> all right. Any questions about AMP kinase? No questions. You will hear about AMP kinase later on in internal medicine because there are drugs which activate AMP kinase and they are, for example, used to treat diabetes. Okay, I'm gonna just leave it there, okay? But, but it's something which is clinically used as a clinical target. All right, so the next 
sensor switch regulator of metabolism is actually mTOR. So now we're going to be talking about mTOR. While AMP kinase is, tells the cell when it's activated, it tells the cell that there is a lack of something. Okay, so it's activated when there's not enough ATP. mTOR, on the other hand, is a signal of abundance. We have plenty of everything. Okay, we can do whatever we want. That is the signal that mTOR gives. So what does mTOR stand for? Well, it's actually an abbreviation of mammalian, so that of mammals, mammalian target of rapamycin. I'll explain what, why this weird name, target of rapamycin. So rapamycin was, is an antibiotic which was discovered on the Easter Island, or the way we call it Easter Island, but the native name for Easter Island is Rapa Nui, and they discovered it in, like, in, the, in the dirt there, uh, and called the antibiotic rapamycin. That was in, I think, mid-1960s or end of 1960s. And rapamycin has very interesting effects. It's not really used for fighting infections, uh, but it has huge effects on the immune system, also on cancer, etc., etc. And it took about 20 years to discover where it's actually doing or through, through which proteins it's, it's causing the effects. And when these proteins were discovered, they were called target of rapamycin. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. And this was done in yeast. And then in humans, it was discovered, or in, mama in, in mammals, that, that there is a similar protein, and they call it mammalian target of rapamycin. Okay? Make sense? Good. So mTOR, or you can often find it as an mTOR complex, is also a protein kinase. It's also a serine threonine kinase. So similar to AMP kinase, it, it, it will phosphorylate specific serines or threonines on, uh, uh, on other proteins. But this time, mTOR, or the mTOR complex, is a massive protein, okay? It has about one million Daltons, okay? Uh, it actually forms dimers that have about one million Daltons, so it's a massive protein, which is associated with lysosomes in the, um, in the cell, so huge thing. And it contains lots of different subunits and lots of different regulatory proteins which influence its function and allow, allow this protein to really work as a, as a integrator of signals, okay? So it's not a simple switch, okay? Something happens and this switch is on or, or off, the way, for example, AMP kinase is, even though that is a little bit more complicated as well. But here, lots of different signals will try to activate or deactivate mTOR, and it will switch on and off depending on how these signals are integrated. So it's a, rel it's a very complex, uh, complex uh, process. So mTOR can be activated by, for example, can be activated by amino acids, by the availability of amino acids. And specifically, the amino acids that activate mTOR are arginine, methionine, and leucine. So what it basically means that mTOR, through some other associated proteins, senses how much of the amino acids are available to the cell, and if they are available, it activates, and it basically tells the cell, okay, you can start proliferating, you can start dividing, you can start making DNA or whatever. We have, we have, we have it, okay? Another activator of mTOR are a range of growth factors. Okay, so there are lots of different signaling molecules uh, called growth factors, and as the name suggests, it, they tell cells, specific cells, okay, you can start growing, you can start proliferating, okay? This obviously doesn't happen directly. Those growth factors bind to receptors on the membrane, and there's a signaling cascade which ends on mTOR. But growth factors are 
a, one of the activators of mTOR. Makes sense? Yeah? If cell wants to grow, it needs a signal to grow. Now, of course, in pathological situations, especially in cancer, this pathway through growth factor signaling can be altered, and some cancers can activate their mTOR even in the, in the complete absence of growth factors. Okay? So they will actually grow even though no growth factors are available. Not all cancers do it. There are many cancers that are dependent on, on growth factors, but there are some which just don't care and activate their mTOR without growth factors uh, being present or being uh, important. Now, at the same time, mTOR will also be blocked by some signals. Okay? And one of the signals we already saw, which blocks its function. What is it? AMP kinase, right? Because we don't really want the cell to start growing if it doesn't have enough ATP, right? That wouldn't work, okay? Another blocking signal is a damage to DNA. I'm not gonna go into details how it is sensed, okay? But, but DNA damage will also block mTOR, again, if, it's, if there's a damaged DNA, you, you definitely don't want the cell to start growing or dividing, okay? Maybe it's better to destroy it through apoptosis or some other, uh, some other process. So when, so when the when those two things happen, the cell is going to go into apop apoptosis? Um, it can do, but of course, all these signals work in a context, and I'm showing you three regulatory proteins, but there are hundreds of them, okay? So what specifically happens to a cell will depend on many other processes. So for example, DNA damage will probably not cause autophagy, even it may, for example, to, to destroy the damaged DNA, it's a possibility, but it's very likely that, that the blocking of mTOR and activating other things will cause apoptosis. The cell will kill itself because it's damaged, okay? So, I'm showing you just a, a small portion of all the regulatory proteins. They are important, they are probably the most important, but they're not the only ones. And the, the end result will depend on all the other signals and all the context, you know, is the cell being activated by something, does it have an oxygen, et cetera. All right, so AMP kinase is a signal of lack of nutrients, lack of ATP. mTOR, on the other hand, is a signal of we have plenty of nutrients, the cell is healthy, let's start dividing, let's start you know, growing. So what would be the pathways to be stimulated by mTOR, and which pathways would be downregulated by mTOR? So cell wants to grow, wants to divide. What do we need to upregulate? Okay, so that's, that's the end process. When everything is ready, when everything is built up, then the cell will divide, okay? Okay, so mitogenesis absolutely would be activated. Here it's interesting that we have two signals which are signaling completely different things, right? One is signaling a lack of stuff, here it's signaling abundance, but they will have a similar effect, and that is creation of new mitochondria. Yeah, absolutely. We want to make new mitochondria, first of all, to make even more ATP, okay? but we also need mitochondria for all sorts of other pathways. So making new mitochondria, absolutely, mTOR will activate that. Again, through PGC1 alpha, if you're interested. Cell cycle? It will affect cell cycle, but I will leave that in brackets, okay? So because it's a, it's a complicated thing, but yes, cell cycle will be affected by mTOR activation, absolutely. But think in very simple metabolic pathways. What do we need to activate to make more of a cell? Replication hmm? Okay, so replication of DNA is regulated by cell cycle processes, but in order to make more DNA, to replicate it, we need? More proteins. We need more proteins, but we also need more nucleotides to make, a, to make DNA. PPP, and we need pentose phosphate pathway, absolutely. So we will increase pentose phosphate pathway, we will increase nucleotide synthesis. And we will also increase the synthesis of proteins. We need to make a lot of proteins, a lot of enzymes, a lot of structural proteins, etc. So protein synthesis will absolutely be activated as well. Okay. 
that is also part of the reason why we use amino acids as the, as the stimuli, right? In, or, in order to make proteins, we need amino acids, so we need to be sure that we have enough uh, amino acids. All right, which pathways would be down-regulated? And we already spoke about one of them, and that's probably the most important one that, to look at, and that is autophagy. So mTOR activation will block autophagy, which makes perfect sense because if we are building more of a cell, we don't want to be eating it at the same time, right? So we're building more components of the cell, we want to stop autophagy, otherwise we would have a vicious circle where we'd be building things and degrading things at the same time. Uh, ketone bodies would probably be inhibited, but again, that is a liver-specific pathway, okay? It's not really anywhere else. Uh, so in, in the liver, things would look a little bit differently, because actually mTOR is activated by insulin as well, etc. It becomes complicated, but yeah, it, it would be inhibited in the liver, absolutely. Huh? Yeah, protolysis, yeah, degradation of proteins would be degraded, but here, again, we're now we're talking about very highly regulated processes, uh, both the proteasome, de proteasome degradation, et cetera. So some proteins actually may be degraded even more if they are needed for some regulation. So that's a complicated thing. Let's leave autophagy there, okay? Most of the other pathways would be upregulated, including glycolysis, for example, because we want to be making not only, so I'm gonna put glycolysis here. We want to activate that not only because we need ATP, but through glycolysis and through pyruvate production, we are also making building blocks for other things, for nucleotides, for heme production, for some amino acids, etc. So we will definitely upregulate glycolysis as well because the cell needs as much nutrients, as much carbon skeletons to, to build new things. So glycolysis will be activated as well. Yes? Does cholesterol production go up? It does, it does. Cholesterol production is also increased, yeah and fatty acid synthesis. Oh, we haven't had that yet. So I'm gonna put lipid synthesis, and it covers both fatty acids and cholesterol, absolutely. Yes? The Krebs cycle can also be activated. Mostly it's gonna be through mitogenesis because it's gonna be more of the enzymes and everything. But yeah, Krebs cycle will be activated as well. Penosulfate pathway. Yes, and we'll cover that towards the end of lecture when we look at the changes in cancer metabolism. But you're right. Yes, we can reverse part of the Krebs cycle to make an ADP. So but, absolutely. Yeah. So making mo more of Krebs cycle enzymes does not necessarily determine which way the Krebs cycle will turn. Okay, because there are other regulations which will decide. Which of the path, which of, which parts of the Krebs cycle would be would be more activated, more active, and not? All right, it's time for a break. I think. Any questions about mTOR? No questions. All right, so. We'll, we'll take a short break, but before we get there, just to make a little bridge to what we're going to be doing after the break. When I said that glycolysis is activated, this activation of glycolysis through mTOR actually goes through the next switch that we'll be talking about, which is called HIF, or HIF, which stands for hypoxia inducible factor. And this is the switch that we'll cover after the break. Okay, so that's a connection between them. And let's take a three minute break. Okay, five minute break, but let's, let's make sure that, it, that we start in five minutes. Continue with the third and last switch and regulator of metabolism in strain situations, let's put it that way. Let's put it that way. And this one is called, as I mentioned before the break, is called hypoxia inducible factor, or HIF. And as the name suggests, it is a protein which is activated, or rather stabilized, as we'll see in a second, 
in situations where the, uh, where the cell finds itself in an environment with low concentration or no concentration of oxygen. Okay, so it's a sensor of oxygen, which then regulates all sorts of things in the cell so that the cell can hopefully survive this hypoxia. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, how does it work? The previous two sensor switches were protein kinases. So they were able to directly go and, and phosphorylate enzymes, etc., and change their activity through that. Hypoxia-inducible factor is not a protein kinase. It's actually a transcription factor. So it's a protein which can influence, increase, or decrease the transcription of specific genes in the nucleus. Okay, so it's a transcription factor. Now, it's a transcription factor which actually exists in two halves, okay? So the active form is then a dimer, but it has two different halves of the protein. There is HIF alpha, which sits in the cytoplasm, and then there is HIF beta, which is in the nucleus sitting on the DNA. in cytoplasm, okay? So this one is in the nucleus, this one is in cytoplasm. Now, under normal conditions where the cell has plenty of oxygen, this HIF alpha in the cytoplasm will be hydroxylated by enzymes called prolyl hydroxylases. prolyl hydroxylases. Why prolyl? Why is it called prolyl hydroxylase? Because it hydroxylates proline residues in the protein. Proline, an amino acid? Yeah? Okay. So a prolyl hydroxylase is an enzyme that, hy that hydroxylates specific proline residues in the protein. And it, it puts OH groups on them. Now, this hydroxylated HIF is then very quickly tagged with ubiquitin. With ubiquitin. And is destroyed in proteasome. Now, where is this? Any question? Can you explain again the part with the uh, hydroxyl Yeah, so HIF sits in the, uh, HIF alpha sits in the cytoplasm, and under normal conditions when there's plenty of oxygen, there are enzymes called proline hydroxylases, which will very quickly hydroxylate the proline residues, which leads to the addition of ubiquitin and destruction of HIF alpha in the proteasome. Now, where is this sensing of oxygen? Well, these prolyl hydroxylases absolutely need oxygen in order to hydroxylate these proline residues. They also, interestingly, need iron. And even more interestingly, they need 2-oxoglutarate for them to work. I'm just mentioning it. It's not super important for the mechanism at this point. Okay? It's just an interesting connection between the Krebs cycle and the sensing of hypoxia. It's just an interesting thing that they need to oxoglutarate to work. They actually even need ascorbic acid. A lot of, lot of cofactors that these, that these, um, uh, these prolyhydroxylases need. But anyway, the idea behind oxygen sensing is that normally any HIF alpha sitting in the membrane will be practically immediately hydroxylated and destroyed. So there's no free HIF alpha in a normally functioning cell. Okay? We actually do these analyses in our, in, in, in our lab, and in a normal cell which is exposed to normal levels of oxygen, you can't detect any HIF alpha. You can't see it there. Because it's, it's being produced in the, in the, um, by the ribosomes, and it's being immediately destroyed by this, by this process. However, when oxygen concent concentration goes down, this proyl hydroxylation stops or slows down, and HIF alpha, this unhydroxylated, this normal HIF alpha, will start to accumulate in the cytoplasm. 
And when it accumulates, it is free to join its other half in the nucleus, form a dimer, and this dimer then acts as the transcription factor to change, to increase or decrease the, um, the expression of various genes. Does it make sense how this works? So when there's plenty of oxygen, HIF alpha in the cytoplasm will be immediately destroyed by proyl hydroxylases. Hydroxylation, ubiquitination, destruction in proteasome. But when the concentration of glucose decreases, uh, sorry, the concentration of oxygen decreases, these proyl hydroxylases are no longer able to hydroxylate it. Therefore, it will not become destroyed in proteasomes. It will accumulate in the, in the cytoplasm, and as it accumulates, it's, it's, it allows it, because it exists, right? It allows it to go into the nucleus, join with its brother, HIF beta, and start influencing gene, trans uh, gene transcription, gene, gene expression. Okay? So, what is the transcription factor of this? The, the, combina the dimer form. The dimer the of HIF alpha and HIF beta. Is the transcription yes. factor? Yeah. Now, what are the genes? Well, first of all, uh, this regulation, as you can probably already see, is much slower than the regulation through protein phosphorylation. So AMP kinase or even mTOR can switch on and off these enzymes really quickly, okay, in seconds. Okay? Here, the, the HIF alpha regulation will take at least minutes, but probably hours, to take effect because, you know, there needs to be mRNA produced, the mRNA needs to go to ribo, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a much longer, much slower process, okay? So that's one thing to, to bear in mind, that regulation through HIF is a much slower process than the switching off and on of, um, uh, of enzymes through AMP kinase, for example. Now, what will be the genes that will be switched on by the activation of HIF alpha? Well, one of the obvious ones, perhaps, are glycolytic enzymes. Because if a cell does not have enough oxygen, it will probably, at the same time, not have enough ATP. It can't really produce any, any or not enough ATP because its oxidative phosphorylation is not functioning. There's no oxygen. So one of the, one of the enzymes to be upregulated um, by the activation of HIF are glycolytic enzymes. And one of the super important ones are hexokinases. Okay, so different types of hexokinases. Because they are the, the first step, right, right, that pulls glucose in and puts it into, um, uh, into glycolysis. Now, in contrast to the previous regulations where we also wanted to increase glycolysis, right, for whatever reason, here we are in hypoxia, so the type of glycolysis that we are trying to start is actually anaerobic glycolysis. The previous types of glycolysis were probably aerobic because we had plenty of oxygen around, right? But this glycolysis that we want to start is anaerobic glycolysis. And for that, we need a different enzyme, a special enzyme which is, which is only specific to anaerobic glycolysis. And that is? Lactate dehydrogenase. So the expression of lactate dehydrogenase will also be stimulated by uh, by this activated HIF um, uh, transcription factor. Now, since we are trying to make more flux, put more flux into glycolysis, again, we need to get the glucose from somewhere, right? So once again, we need to increase the amount of transporters in the cell. Here it is going to be through transcription, so a slower process, but again, the, the amount or the number of glute transporters, in this case, it's mostly one and three, not super important, okay, but just for your information, uh, it's one and three, so these will be upregulated by, uh, by this regulation. Again, makes sense, we need to get glucose because that is the only source in hypoxia, that's the only source of ATP, right? Anaerobic glycolysis, there's nothing else that the cell, uh, cell can use. And another thing that will be upregulated, and here we are getting much closer to intercellular signaling and kind of a broader, because I said in the beginning, this lecture focuses on one cell as if it was alone, okay? But here I want to show you that another thing that will be upregulated are signaling molecules, 
that tell the surroundings of the cell to basically bring more, bring more blood, okay? Because if there's hypoxia, one of the, one of the uh, measures that can be taken by the body is to bring more oxygen, right? Um, so the things that will be upregulated is a hormone called erythropoietin. Maybe some of you have heard about it. So erythropoietin. or EPO, erythropoietin, uh, is a hormone which stimulates the production of red blood cells in the, uh, uh, in the bone marrow, okay? So this regulation through HIF and erythropoietin is, for example, the reason why people who go to you know, very high altitudes, like in the Himalayas or something like that, their number of red blood cells will increase, and this is the mechanism. So HIF-1-alpha will be activated in kidneys because erythropoietin is mostly secreted from the kidneys. So HIF-1-alpha is activated and erythropoietin is increased. Therefore, more red blood cells, therefore more oxygen is brought to cells. So can you know something about the affinity of the, the non-limit to the oxygen? There was this one enzyme that uh, alters the affinity and this is why, like, you catch the oxygen when you're in the lungs and you release yeah. the oxygen. Yeah, the 2,3 bisphosphoglycerate, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is something that happens as well, but it is not directly related, as far as I know, to HIF activation, okay? It's actually done at a, at a different level, this regulation. <laughs> the other signaling molecule, one second, the other signaling molecule that I want to mention, which also acts to bring more blood, more oxygen to the cells, is a growth factor called BEGF, which stands for a vascular endothelial growth factor. And this signaling molecule basically makes, or you know, it, it makes the surrounding cells to make more blood vessels. So it allows, it pr basically pushes the surrounding tissue to start making more blood vessels so that the cells that, ha that are hypoxic can actually get more, um, uh, more oxygen, more blood. And this is a process that actually occurs even in, you know, when, when an embryo and, or a fetus grows or some of our other tissues are regenerating, at some point the growing cells will, will be too far from a, from a blood vessel and they will need to tell the blood vessels, okay, grow this way because we're lacking oxygen. Okay? And this is, the, um, this is the signaling cascade or the signaling method that does this. Well, what are the things that we want to downregulate? If there's not enough oxygen, what do we want to downregulate? I'm not sure it would like directly downregulate it, but the electron transport chain. Is Absolutely. Yeah. What's the point of having an electron transport chain if we don't have any oxygen, right? So electron transport chain will absolutely be downregulated, mainly through complex four. So the expression of complex four will go down. Yeah, that's the last complex, the one that actually deals with oxygen, okay? That is not to say that the mitochondria would be completely discard discarded, right? We still need them for other things. But yeah, they will absolutely be downregulated. And since we are downregulating the, the number of uh, complexes in the mitochondria, we also downregulate mitogenesis. Why make more mitochondria if we don't have enough oxygen? Well, we do need to reoxidize the reduced cofactors, but for that we will mainly use lactate dehydrogenase because there's no other way to reoxidize them, right? There's no oxygen. So it's not really useful for any way, uh, for anything. The next pathway or the last pathway that I want, just one second, that, that it will be downregulated is the Krebs cycle because again, without oxygen, it's not gonna run, okay? It may run partly, but, but not, not a lot. So the Krebs cycle will be downregulated and once again, the main enzyme that will be affected by this is pyruvate dehydrogenase. So the gatekeeper into the Krebs cycle, really. So pyruvate dehydrogenase, and more specifically, it's through pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which is the regulatory enzyme. So this, this is actually the target of a HIF uh, signaling or HIF um, expression. It's the kinase that will be affected, but in the end, it's, the, uh, it's PDH. You had a question?
Absolutely. And we'll see in a second when we go through the actual situations that, yeah, a lot of these things will be activated at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Any questions about hypoxia and hypoxia signaling? No questions. All right. So now let's put it all together and let's have a look at these situations, these three situations that I mentioned, and let's see whether we can figure out what, what's going to be activated, what's going to be deactivated in these situations. So the first situation is hypoxia. So imagine a cell is in hypoxia. What will happen? Which switches will be activated, which switches will be deactivated, and which pathways will be activated and deactivated in hypoxia? HIF alpha will be activated. Indeed. So we'll activate HIF. Absolutely. Because we'll prob most likely we will not be producing enough ATP, so AMP kinase would be activated. Absolutely. Decrease MTO. And it's very likely that directly or indirectly, mostly indirectly, mTOR would also be downregulated, or we, the activity would be decreased, mostly through these signalings. Yes? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So some of these switches and some of these signaling cascades go against each other, right? One of them, as you said correctly, one of them would increase mitogenesis, the other one should decrease mitogenesis. The, the signaling in the cell, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, different signals which integrate and which form a context for the, for the cell, what the cell is, is going to end up doing, okay? So it's so complicated that it's even impossible to model mathematically. It's just too, too complex. But you're right. These, some of these things will go, in some respects, against each other. And one of them will be more important and the other one will be less important. But that will depend on many other signals that occur in the cell, which we are neglecting here. So something will happen, but basically the only way to determine that is experimentally. You just look at it and you see what happens because it's way too complicated. All right, so which pathways would be in this situation, which pathways would be upregulated and which, or pathways, which proteins or whatever pro processes would be upregulated and downregulated in this case? We covered most of it, so. Okay, sure. Uh, again, that's something that happens at the level of the whole organism, right? This, a cell on its own can't produce its own red blood cells, but yes. So there will be an increase in erythropoietin, absolutely. Glute transporters? Yeah, glute will absolutely go up. Sorry, glute. Yeah, absolutely. What about it? Okay, so glycolysis would be activated, okay. Let's, let's stay one second, let's stay with glycolysis. So glycolysis would be activated. But more specifically, which anaerobic. it would be anaerobic glycolysis. So glycolysis, glycolytic enzymes, plus lactate dehydrogenase, okay? Because in other situations, that might not be, uh, that might not be the case. So yeah, glycolysis activated, absolutely. You wanted to continue? Yes. Yeah, that, that is true, that is true, but in order to convert pyruvate to lactate, you also need the enzyme, right? So you're right, there will be accumulation of NADH and you need to do something with it, but you also need the enzyme. So, so what signaling through HIF would produce enough of the enzyme so that it can, uh, it can catalyze this, uh, this reaction. But you're right, I mean, the, the pressure to make lactate would be there also because there's a block of reoxidation of NADH, absolutely, yeah. Autophagy uh, probably would be activated, yes, even though it's questionable whether it's actually useful for anything, and there might be other signals which would block it because it would say, like, you know, that's ridiculous, why do it now? But from what we know, yes, probably autophagy would be activated as well. What would be deactivated? Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, cholesterol lipid production absolutely inactivated. What's the point? Gluconeogenesis deactivated, absolutely. Probably, if we look at mTOR, what else would be, if we decrease the activity of mTOR, what else would be stopped? Huh? Protein yeah, protein synthesis, absolutely. Hmm? Pendosulfate path pathway, probably, yes. Yes, that's through HIF signaling, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And DNA synthesis and production of organelles, et cetera, would be, would be blocked. Perhaps the Krebs cycle would, might want to go up because of NPK, but it has no, like, has no intermediate, so HIF would win that, uh, that battle. Yeah. So it would be inhibited as well. Yeah, very likely, but again, bear in mind that this signaling is super quick. This signaling is much slower. Okay, so in the beginning, when the cell, when when the excess to oxygen or the concentration of oxygen drops suddenly, first thing that will win is AMP kinase. Okay, so the cell will try to do everything it can, including maybe you know stimulation of the Krebs cycle. But of course, then HIF comes in and says, yeah, you know, not a good idea. Uh, let's do something else. But yeah, those two would fight each other, but there is a time lag. So the time would also decide in the various phases what, what would happen. Right. So that's hypoxia. The other situation which is related but different is a lack of nutrients. So which, which pathways or which of the signals would be activated and which deactivated? So HIF would be doing nothing, yeah, deactivated, yeah, okay. There's no HIF, basically, yeah. Absolutely. So this is a situation in many ways similar to what we had before, but there are quite significant differences. So what would be the differences between these two situations? What are the different things? Yeah, so glycolysis would be stimulated, but probably not so much LDH because we don't really need it, hopefully, yeah. Autophagy would be what? Yeah, it would be increased. Here in the previous example we said we don't know because there are probably other signals influencing it, but it's possible, yes, here autophagy would very likely be increased, yeah, absolutely. Mitogenesis would be increased, yeah, absolutely. Ketone body production is tricky, okay? First of all, it happens in the liver. It's a, it's a special thing. And it's regulated much more on the level of the whole organism through glucagon and some other signaling, okay? So I would leave ketogenesis, it's a special pathway, okay? I would leave that aside. What else could we expect in, in this situation, which is different from the previous? Uh, Breakdown of protein, yeah, through autophagy. So the stimulated autophagy would probably start breaking down proteins, absolutely. What pathways would we block? Fat acid synthesis. Cholesterol synthesis. Cholesterol synthesis. Gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. Again, liver specific, really, or liver kidney specific pathway, but yes. Mito more, uh, glute transporters? Yeah, absolutely. Glute transporters would be upregulated and transported into the membrane, absolutely. Hmm? Yes, the mTOR would be inhibited both by this lack of nutrients on its own, but also through, through AMPK, absolutely. That's absolutely correct. So the last situation that I want to focus on is this hyperproliferation state. So that's a state which is very different. Here we have a lack of something. Hyperproliferation, on the other hand, usually occurs, usually occurs when there's plenty of everything. But this usually, I will show in a second, that there are also situations where cells proliferate even though they don't have everything and they have to figure that out. So in hyperproliferation, what would we expect with these, with these signals? Huh? AMPK goes down. Yeah, so AMPK, that depends on the specific situation of the cell, but we probably wouldn't expect it to be activated. Okay, unless something goes wrong. So the main driver 
of this hyperproliferative state would be mTOR. Yeah, so mTOR is activated through all its different signals. The other ones probably are not going to be activated, but again, we don't know, or indirectly they may be activated because we said that mTOR is capable of activating HIF, for example, yeah, so that there are indirect ways to, to do it. Now, what happens in this situation, apart from increasing protein synthesis and DNA synthesis and all these things that we, that we covered, we also have to change, we have to reprogram the metabolic pathways in the cell so that it can afford this massive production of proteins and lipids, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So the normal ways of functioning of, of cellular metabolism, we usually look at, you know, the, we look at cells being quite catabolic and just, you know, making ATP and being very quiet and et cetera. But here, we, we suddenly have to change things quite significantly. So one of the main changes in these hyperproliferative cells uh, is that they bring in massive amounts of glucose and often massive amounts of glutamine. So glucose and glutamine. So normal quiescent cells will take you know, fatty acids and maybe a little bit of glucose and maybe some amino acids and they just kind of chug along and make enough ATP to survive. These cells need massive amounts of stuff, okay? So they will put up huge amounts of GLUT. We know how it's regulated, right? Through, through mTOR as well. They will increase the amounts of glycolytic enzymes. So they will have a huge glycolytic flux, massive one. But what is important for these cells is that the majority, and especially if we are talking about cancer cells, the majority of glucose would not actually be converted all the way to carbon dioxide. Why not? Why do we not really want to convert it to carbon dioxide? Huh? Not because it's acidic. I mean, that may cause problems, but why in a growing, rapidly dividing cell, we don't really want to take glucose and just break it down to carbon dioxide? Well, because we need building blocks for lipids, for nucleotides, for proteins, etc. Okay, so if we oxidize all the glucose to carbon dioxide, where, where do we get all these other, other things from, right? So a lot of glucose in these fast growing cells is converted, interestingly, to lactates, and we produce ATP, or the cell produces ATP through what we would call aerobic glycolysis, so the cells usually have plenty of oxygen, but they still produce lactate. And part of the glucose will then go to pentose phosphate pathway. Why to pentose phosphate pathway? Huh? And why do we need NADPH in this, in this situation? Mm, not really. Sorry? Nope, that's not the point here. So first, because we need ribose, absolutely, for nucleotides. Yeah, that's one important thing. If we are growing, if we are proliferating, we absolutely need ribose. But what do we need this NADPH for? Absolutely, for fatty acid synthesis and for cholesterol synthesis. Okay, so... Lipid synthesis, we need, we need massive amounts of NAD, NADPH to, to make this. Because as they're growing, they need to make new membranes, right? If you're making new cells, you need a lot of new membranes. And it's not just plasma membrane, it's you know, mitochondrial membrane and endoplasmic reticulum. It's a ton of lipids that the cell has to produce. So for that, you need a lot of NADPH, okay? So some, go, some of the glucose goes into pentose phosphate pathway, and then some goes into the Krebs cycle, but not to be broken down to carbon dioxide. Definitely not. We don't really want that. But in order to make all these other building blocks, so to make amino acids from 2-ketoglutarate or to make uh, heme using, what is, the, what is the stuff that we need to make heme? Glycine. Well, we need glycine, sure. But from the Krebs cycle? Succinyl-CoA, okay? So succinyl-CoA will, will be used to make heme. 
some of the other components will be used to make nucleotides, etc. So the Krebs cycle works in these cells, but not to break down everything to carbon dioxide and to make ATP. Actually, most of the ATP will be made here, okay? But this is needed to make other things that the cell needs to grow. Now, what happens with glutamine? Uh, well, actually, there's another reason why, well, or rather, one of the importance of Krebs, of Krebs cycle in rapidly growing cells is another intermediate from the Krebs cycle, which is also needed for the synthesis of something else. So we mentioned succinyl-CoA for heme, some other ones, but there's another one which is absolutely crucial to make something that we already mentioned. Oxalacetate for what? Hmm. Uh, how? Okay, so it is citrate that I'm thinking about. And what is the main thing that citrate is needed for? And it's absolutely needed for? For fatty acid synthesis. So it's related to phospholipids, of course, but it's all fatty acids that are synthesized from citrate. Is that something that rings a bell? Indeed, absolutely. If you want to make a fatty acid, it has to come through the Krebs cycle to make citrate. Citrate goes out of the mitochondrion and then citrate lies, makes acetyl-CoA, which is then used for fatty acid synthesis. So if these cells are trying to synthesize a lot of fatty acids, this glucose has to go into the Krebs cycle, make citrate, and then citrate goes out and is used to make fatty acids, acetyl-CoA and fatty acids. Okay, so for fatty acids, heme, all sorts of other things. Okay, now how is it with glutamine? Glutamine is a major substrate for rapidly growing cells, both normal ones, white blood cells, etc., but also for cancer cells. And what it, why is it good? Why, why is glutamine such a good substrate? Well, because it enters the Krebs cycle as what? Alpha ketoglutarate, okay? And either it can run the normal way now I'm getting to your question, okay? Either it can run the normal way and make succinyl-CoA and whatever is needed, or, and that is quite important, especially in cancer cells, it can run in reverse, so I'm gonna do two ketoglutarate. So it can run in reverse the Krebs cycle, and it can make citrate in the end to make fatty acids, okay? So these cells can use glutamine by reversing uh, the Krebs cycle to make as much citrate as they can so they can produce lots of fatty acids which they usually need quite a lot, okay? It can also be used, um, it can also be used, uh, well, to some extent because there could be a cycle to make an ADPH which we talked about, okay? But I'm not gonna go into details but it's a possibility as well, okay? That's only specific to cancer cells, this pathway that's it is quite common in cancer cells, so I'm not 100% sure if any of the normally proliferating cells, rapidly proliferating cells, use this pathway. I don't think so. I think it was first described and still is mentioned mainly in relation to cancer. So this is probably not so much normal, uh, but I'm not ruling out that it may not happen in, in normal cells as well. So as you can see, the, in rapidly growing cells, there is a significant reprogramming of the flows of material compared to what we usually see in a textbook. You know, everything is broken down to carbon dioxide and that's it, okay? Rapidly growing cells need, have very different needs and they have to do things very differently. What would happen if a cancer patient was having hypoxia or Yeah, so <laughs> that's a good question. First of all, Many cancer cells actually live in hypoxia. Why? As the tumor grows, so first when there are a few cells, they're fine, but as the tumor grows, it is moving away from the blood supply and everything is disrupted. So if you have a, if you have a tumor, even like a relatively small tumor, a lot of the cells, a lot of the cancer cells will be hypoxic. But 
using HIF signaling and everything, they usually can find a way to survive even at very low levels of oxygen. So they can't really survive at zero oxygen, but at low, so there will be necrosis and the cells will be dying, which you normally see in a tumor. Uh, but most of the cells can figure out a way and reprogram stuff so that they can live at relatively low levels of oxygen, okay? So that's hypoxia. Now, starvation, and that's something that you may have come across as a method for treating cancer or something like that, not eating sugar and starving yourselves. That doesn't work at all. And the reason why it doesn't work at all is that our body is actually trying always to keep some level of glucose because we need it for the brain and everything. So it's basically impossible to starve yourselves enough to kill cancer cells, but not kill yourselves. That's just impossible. That can't be done. So these various methods that you can find on the internet and people do and, you know, drinking vegetable juices and not eating sugar, that doesn't help at all. Um, and actually, some cancers are very good at coaxing the rest of the body, liver, at everything by producing signaling molecules to provide them with what they need and also making other cells around them, normal cells around them, to give them various nutrients. There are even, there's been uh, a few years ago, um, a transfer of mitochondria was described between cancer cells and normal cells. So they can make the surrounding normal cells give them mitochondria, which they need for something. So they, they don't produce their own, they just steal them from elsewhere. So cancer cells, some cancer cells are extremely, you know, they, they find strategies to make them survive. So starving or making hypoxia is not gonna, is not gonna kill them, unfortunately. Yeah. What if we modify the diet so that we don't have any good well, that would influence badly other important cells. So for example, the, uh, as we talked about intestinal epithelium or white blood cells, they rely on glutamine quite a lot. And even if we didn't eat any glutamine in, in our diet, our body, same with glucose, they, it would just start producing glutamine because that is what a lot of the, a lot of the cells uh, need. So yeah, however, once you get to whatever fifth year or something and you start talking about oncology, some cancers can be actually affected by removing some of the nutrients. So for example, there are leukemias where you can use an enzyme called asparaginase, but decrease asparagine because they need asparagine to grow. And it's injected to patients and it decreases the amount of asparagine in the blood and it really, really works. And it really is one of the most effective treatments for very specific types of leukemias. So yes, influencing this metabolism can be potentially a really good treatment, but it's very difficult to do and not kill the patient at the same time. All right, that's it. And that's it for this course. Uh, good luck with the, with the test. And we'll see each other uh, in the next course talking about signaling and everything.